Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, one, wonderful to be back. This is our uh, this is our second attempt at this uh, at this session. Uh, so we we originally planned to do this at Lean Agile London uh, earlier this year. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Jordy was uh, was unavailable at the time, so I uh, I ended up having to uh, go out and catch an actual executive to uh, to talk to. Um, people seem to have liked it. Um, anyway. Uh, we're, we're here again, once again, Jordy was unavailable. So I had to dig into my context and I managed to find the incredibly attractive Antonio Mandatas, uh, to co-host with me. Um, but because he's such a great actor, um, you know, if you hover over his uh, screen right now, you see that he's actually taken on the persona of Jordi Fagoa, oh, that's right. except that's just right. way more attractive than the real thing. Absolutely. If, even if you see him in person, yes. <laughs> um, all jokes so aside, though, this is the uh, this is the how to talk to executives um, track. Um, my name is my name is Will. I'm a, I'm a consultant. I own my own company, uh, and I I met Jordi uh, a while ago, and I think we we initially had this conversation in an Uber drive on the way back to the airport, and we were like, we should yes. We're very interesting people to listen to when we talk together. So sh we should expose more people to it, and that's kind of how we how we pitched it to uh, to Ahmad and uh, and to Jose, and they and were Jose. like, "Yeah, that's you and are amazing, with interesting it. people." So, right. which is uh, which is how we find ourselves today. Um, and and of course, Antonio. Sorry, Jordi. I know you're in character. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe a bit about you as well. A bit about me. Um... I always felt insecure and wanted to cope with that insecurity. The way I did that was by learning lots of things. And then I thought the more I learned, the more secure I feel that didn't work. And then uh, due to some uh, professional challenges, I had to start uh, interacting with executives. And my biggest concern like, wow, how do I talk to these people? How how are they? How how do I deal with them, etc.? cetera? And, um, and at first it was from um, real admiration slash fear. Then it was from imposter syndrome. How can I look good in front of them? And ultimately I realized, there, well, it's not just, but they're also people. Therefore, um, they have certain particularities. And uh, that's, that's the most important topic we need to be conscious about when we're talking to them. But other than that, we can tell them anything we believe is helpful. We can be direct, we can be honest, and um, hope that uh, what most of this talk will be about. Over to you. Yeah. So we have, um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, give everything away right now. There are um, three things that we want you to know um, about dealing with executives. And hopefully these are things that you will um, just have in your in your toolbox in your DNA walking away from this conversation and we'll go into each of them in detail um, but uh, the three things we want you to never forget when dealing with these people is one their reality is such that they're always one or two bad decisions away from losing their job in a very very public way All right so the stress is unlike anything um, you feel in any other different context. The second one is actually they don't have special knowledge or special abilities. And half the time they don't have all the answers either. Um, it's just way harder for them to show it and be honest about it. Yes. And yes. the third one is because of what power does to people, not just the person that holding the power, but also dealing with people in powerful positions, they can't really trust anyone. Um, now, those three things you want to keep with you in all of your conversations and all of your dealings, but what those mean and how those and how we can deal with that is something that Jordi and I are going to explore together in this conversation. That's right. Yeah, I would I would like to add on top of that this idea that sometimes we believe they have um, all the decision power, and even though they are executives, they're just executing what has been agreed so it's been thrown upon them i'm talking any level 
uh, below senior vice president. So you can be a vice president and you're just executing on uh, some initiative that somebody at the XCOM ha have decided, and then you're the one executing it and reporting it to them. Um, another one is they need, they have to be successful and also sometimes show evidence of that success. Uh, and that they are ver they have very very limited time so you go to them you want to tell them your funky idea and all that stuff and they don't have time for you it's not that they dislike you it's that they're just so overwhelmed with stuff and decisions and working um nine to nine that uh, it makes it really hard to interact with them therefore when you go talk to them you need to be straight to the point really sharp uh, and focused so let's uh, let's start at the top, right? Um, they're they're one or two bad decisions away from losing their job. Um, why is that, Jordi? Well, basically, when you are at this level, what happens is uh, you it is is it is taken for granted that you're competent. So you need to show competency, and when it's evident or it's visible that you're not competent either by decisions that you're making or by how you act in front of others um others at, at the power they don't want to be around with people like this and therefore um there is a way there is a mechanism in companies that take eject people that are not competent enough or that they don't show uh being skilled enough i'm i'm talking mostly xcom now pps as well but mostly xcom and um yeah sometimes they they disguise that by moving people to other places by by changing moving to a different company but um it's really hard to make decisions at this level they need to be informed they don't have time to to have all the right information and get everything that they need to make the decision so still with limited amount of information they need to make the decision and if they make it wrong and stakeholders shareholders know about that uh that that becomes visible uh, in the past i used to think well executives shouldn't be a big deal they're not the decision makers ultimately shareholders are decision makers and then uh what's the what's the worst thing that can happen to them well lots of things if Let's say you're just investing some money in any company. You want that company to go up. And then who are accountable for that company to go up? Exco members. And then if they don't go up, um, you can speak up. Or the other thing you can do is just go and stop investing in that company and invest somewhere else. That becomes a problem. What, what, what are your thoughts, Will? I think I think that's part of it. I think there's definitely kind of the idea that uh, the assumption that at that level you're you're able to cut through the noise and and deal with complexity and kind of make make the right decision time and time again in in circumstances of very imperfect information. Whereas the the reality is, and this has been wonderfully researched by uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers, which I can which I can highly recommend. That's right is that right. um, there is a non-trivial amount of luck involved in making the right decisions over and over again. Um, but that's that's not something a lot of people take into account. I think, I think the other part of it is um, at, at an executive level, right? As a, as a vice president, as an SVP, or even above, by the time a decision needs to be made by you, um, usually the accountability you have is that that decision is not going to be a small, easily reversed decision, right? This is not, this is not the agile world we're talking about where it's like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, fire off 30 features and I'll see which ones stick. And if, if half of them or even all of them don't work, then I've wasted like a week of work, two weeks of work, right? By the time based on decision making, yes. Yeah. Right. But mm -hmm. by the time you make a decision there, that's going to be a decision of, you know, are we going to spend 10 million on this thing? And if it doesn't work off, work out, then it's it's a write-off, right? And 10 million is still a relatively small amount. So it's yes. 
it's a combination of really nasty factors, right? That that any any uh, missed opportunity you have or any decision you make that turns out to have been the wrong one um, is is always going to be big, is always going to have serious repercussions, right? People lose their job or it's going to affect the, the stock price in some way. And there's the political fallout, right? Suddenly you're not untouchable anymore. And this creates an enormous amount of pressure, right? There's There's a spotlight on everything you do and everything you say. And, and that comes with fear. And one of the things I've learned in all of that, right, coming kind of from this agile background, working with startups, working with small teams, it took me so long to realize that was their world because it's so different from mine, right? If I mess up, eh, messed up, right? Failures, first attempt in learning. Let's make them adapt. Let's change. Let's course correct. Nope, doesn't yeah. apply there. That Sorry. is not the world. That is just not the world. And so if you come in speaking like that, you sound dangerous and kind of insane. Yeah, let's just do You're it. Naive. Man. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. No, in, in general, um, that is something I learned the hard way. Um, one year ago, I was coaching um, a BP that was working and that had received some FCA um, change in their business, and that was impacting them big time. And his doubt was, okay, so what should I do with it? Should I inform the president um, and then all the repercussions that, the, that will require? Should I inform the MD and then the MD inform the president? Should I keep it silent? What should I do? And there's no easy decision, but if you make the wrong decision, there's a high possibility that you get fired. And in that case, you cannot go and say, let's just explore, let's just try something, and then if that doesn't work, let's change. No, it's like you need to be very, very conscious with how that work looks like. And that is some, some sort of a shock to agile and agility and it becomes very apparent when you talk to coaches that have not uh, been exposed long enough to executives that they say oh, okay so let's try this out then let's see let's engage them they're not paying attention to us of course not then uh, because they have all the priorities and then but we need to we need to get them to pay attention and then when they have like 10 minutes of attention you start telling them how cool you are. Like, no, present the decision, explain why uh, why this decision needs to be made and what are the choices very clearly and, and let them pick them and help them kind of get the right information so that they can make the wisest possible decision. But it's, it's a tough world. I, I wouldn't like to be an executive. Yeah. It's uh, the 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 added uh, the added pain of all of that is that um, you know if you're if you're an agile coach and you get fired from a client that's great news I mean I I wear it as a badge of honor right because our our job is to be annoying so if we no, get no. fired that's a good thing right if you're if you're an amazing developer and you get let go from a client well there's a there's a shortage of amazing developers so you're gonna have a new job whereas if you are in a in a position of serious accountability and they let you go, that really doesn't work in your favor. Um, it, it, it'll make it harder to find another position. Right. And, and there's a lot of survivor bias in the news and we've, we've certainly read our share of, Hey, this person left a trail of destruction at multiple companies and still managed to get hired. But very honest here, those are the, the exception. And a very, very small exception. Now, yeah. one thing to keep in mind in all of this is that um, because of this mindset, right? Because of the stress, because of the fear, because of the pressure, and because most of their decisions are very big with very big repercussions, because they're also just humans, and we'll talk a bit more about that later, they kind of make the same mistake that the uh, us agilists make right we see almost all decisions as small and reversible 
right? Even when they're big and even when they're not, when they're not easily reversible. Executives, I found, tend to do the opposite. Because there's so much pressure on them, they tend to view any decision as really big, impactful, and threatening. That's right. Even when we know it's actually just a small thing and it's easily reversed and there's space to experiment. And so when you talk to them, right, not just, and, and as Jordy said, right, talk about the kind of decision, talk about the data, get to the point, but be very, very explicit in saying what kind of decision are we talking about here, right? And there's, there's, there's a really good, uh, really good article, I think, about Amazon's process where they distinguish between open door and closed door decisions or type one and That's type right. two decisions. That's right. But be very, right, are we talking about a big decision here or are we talking about an easily reversible experiment? And be very clear that that last one comes with zero risk, um, right? And try to create more of those opportunities. Yeah, and, and sometimes your your ability, I was as was thinking of Elizabeth Holmes and Sam Bank, Bankman Fried. Um, those are executives that I'm not sure they will. Yeah, they will they will get a job, but it it's not the same. Um, as agile coaches, they take it for granted that we know what we're talking about. We don't need to go and show them that we know what we're talking about. That That is taken already. It's how can I help you make better decisions? And how can I articulate the situation, the context, the problem, the challenge in a way that it helps you get to a better decision? And when saying get to a better decision, sometimes that also represents get a promotion, get recognition, because they play very frequently with uh, political currency. I call it political currency, which is this idea. If I make a wrong decision, then I need to have some backup currency that they can invest in the next decision. And sometimes when, when they tell me, what's your goal in the transformation? Make whoever hired me successful. That's it. And then when you start focusing on that, they start to notice that you care for them or at least for their success, they start trusting you more. And that creates some buffer, some space for you to start uh, explaining everything that will you just mentioned, all the decision and decision possibilities and the risk involved, etc. You don't do that in the beginning. You don't go and say, oh, by the way, I'm Agile coach, um, just assume my authority. I always start from the um, belief I need to earn my right to have an authority. I don't have it until I prove I have it. And I I will prove my authority by showing them evidence of information or decisions that they need to make that's going to help them become better or more powerful. And I don't get it by explaining all the places that I've been and all the nice things that I've done and everybody that I've been coaching. <laughs> It's not a competition contest. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. I think, I think, uh, especially with with um, with agilists, um, both the juniors and the seniors, we can get lost in idealism sometimes, and it's it's all about yeah, we need to talk about team empowerment and flexibility and changing the governance model and you know different different budgeting approaches and there's validity in all of those things. Right, we say those things for a reason. We say because there's science that backs them up. That there's, there's there's case studies that back them up. Yes. But yes, the reality that we have to acknowledge, especially when you walk into an existing company, right, that has a legacy that that isn't a recent startup, um, is that the top of that company is a lot closer to Game of Thrones, in what the culture is like. Um, right. And so it's in the company, but yes, yes, if you want to get stuff done for the peasants, right. I'm going to stick with the medieval analogy here. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. But if we want to make life better for the people in the teams, for the developers, for, for, for the product owners, for the people, you know, getting, getting value out there. Right. 
you can talk to those people all you want about, here's everything I need you to change about the organization. But the, the point of the matter is, is if you want all of that to happen, you are going to have to give, give these people the political ammunition they need to get those changes across. Right. And we often disregard those people. We see them as either a means to an end, right? You are a tool that I'm going to use to make life for the teams better, which is very disrespectful because they're people too. They even go to the toilet and and stuff. Um, but it's also, it's also not reflecting the reality that if, if you want them to do things, they're going to have to get success in the organization. So that gives them the political power to actually enact those changes because it's often just more than them. And I think Jordi, this, this gets us, um, I think a bit closer to point number two, which is they don't know either. Um, but everyone expects them to be smarter and more knowledgeable. Um, but if you want to talk about people with imposter syndrome, oh my God. Right. It is so bad at the executive level because everyone expects them to know everything, but the reality is they don't. They seem they don't yes, know everything that, that's going on. And go ahead, go ahead. No, no, one hundred percent. That's something that happens quite a lot. You 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 believe that you got when your currency is knowledge, you believe that if you go and, and you certify yourself in something else and you learn something new and you read a new book and you uh, attend a, a new MBA or whatever, that's going to get you closer to that level. Well, the problem is no matter how much time you put into it, you will never know everything uh, more than those that are working in their day-to-day. -day. So your skills need to change. You need to focus in a different level. I, I, I tell this story of... Um, this executive uh, for a large bank um, I was mentoring, he was um, VP for business development growth markets. From there, he moved to um, people and culture or HR department. He was the um, member of the uh, XCOM for HR. And then he moved to CIO. I'm like, what? I mean, how, how does any of that have to do with each other? And the reason he was significantly good at all three of them is he had an ability that perhaps other executives didn't have, which was he was able to get strong contextual awareness in a very short amount of time. And so if you, as coaches, you want to get better at talking to executives, I recommend two things. One, get strong contextual awareness, the reading part, and try to understand what's going to happen if this person doesn't get uh, the, the influence that they want. What's going to happen? This this Game of Thrones, just watch Game of Thrones and think of it as, as executives. And then the second part is show uh, try to speak in a way that doesn't harm, speaks uh, the right language, helps them make decisions. I call it uh, assertiveness, but it doesn't matter. So coming back to this story, so he had the ability to get strong contextual awareness. He had the ability to engage his people. Therefore, he could focus on maneuvering or navigating the political uh, context while having very strong technical people when he was CEO, taking care of everything and telling him of what was significant for him to know to, to, bring, to bring to the expo. And that is that is a very powerful skill. But this person had worked for a long time on uh, personal development, etc. Most people don't do that. They just go and like, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to know about marketing and sales. Therefore, I will act as if I know about marketing and sales. That, that the opposite story is somebody that came and um, he was supposed to lead agility and then I told him that was a huge mistake. Well, basically, agility is, is like common sense. So you just need to focus on making sure that what uh, you get more of what makes sense. And, the, and he said, me, after 10 years for, uh, working as, as agile coach, etc. And he said, oh, okay, yeah, I have common sense. 
Therefore, I could read it in his eyes. Therefore, I know agility. I don't need anybody anymore. Boom, set of wrong decisions, one after the other, and then he got fired. Yeah. It's, it, it, it really, um, and it, it's really something that comes from their environment. And, and I've even fallen into that trap myself. I, I know very well, uh, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my career was um, I'd, I'd done an audit at a company, automotive company, uh, and I found, I found some issues. Uh, and they were big enough to be to 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 get me a meeting with the with the CIO of the company, and he was like, "Well, I've read your report," um, and I'm like, "All right, good, smart man, read through the whole thing, obviously understood everything that was in there." Yeah. There I was, right, CIO, so way smarter than I am. So then I start talking smart as well because I'm insecure about myself and I have to prove that I'm just as smart and can talk at that level. Yeah, it sounds funny now, but this happens, right? This happens to everyone. Um, that's what I tell myself when I cry to sleep. But anyway, so so he's like, well, what do you suggest we do? And I start talking about, you know, we have to reorganize according to value streams and change the operating model and the budgeting approach got in the way and the way we set up leadership was wrong. Kind of all of these things that were in the report and just kind of kind of reiterating them. And at one point, and that, that's the advantage of working with Dutch people, because they'll just tell you if you're being stupid, is he just, yes. he just says, I'm going to stop you right there. You are talking right here. And my organization is right here and I'm maybe over here. So I don't understand a word you're saying, but it sounds very expensive. And I can tell you right now, we're not going to do it. Right. What I should have done when he said, I read the report is start to explore. Well, what did you think? What were the open questions? Um, what were you surprised by? What were you uncertain about? What are your ideas going forward? Right. And really open up that, open up that door and create that safety to ask questions. Because if you come in yes. with the mindset of this person knows everything and is way smarter than I am, and I need to prove my value because otherwise they're never going to talk to me again. I can guarantee you that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to you're going to talk gibberish, you're going to sound like a McKinsey consultant. Um and I say that as an insult. Uh even though I know Jordy's history. Um but you're not you're not going to be that trusted advisor and they're not going to do anything with what you say. It, it it's funny that you say that because I think you just nailed it in two aspects. You said trusted advisor, and trusted comes from trust. And uh, the other, the other topic you mentioned is focus using different words, but focus on the problem space. We are hired as coaches or consultants, no matter what that is. Sometimes we believe we need to bring answers, and every time that has been successful what i've done is explore problems and sometimes suggest some answer that they that is close to their day to day that they can take it and then apply some other times just help them focus on what the right problem is um and and as as both of us know because we talked about that back in the day in this company that we're working together i went to introduce myself to um five or six bps and they were talking, I don't think I like Agile. I'm not sure about Agile. You will need to convince me. And then I said, can I just talk for like one minute? Sure. Um, my name is Jordi. And then I define myself as I am a pragmatic Agile coach, which means I am not willing to convince you of anything. I'm not willing to spend any time um, turning down any of your ideas, whatever. The only thing I'm willing to do is focus on a problem that you have already acknowledged. Another typical mistake of agile coaches that just explain problems they don't see, so that and then spend time making them see them so that we can fix them. I will focus on one problem that you have and have acknowledged, and then don't worry, we will wrap it up in agile. So just that, that made me be trusted advisor because they thought, 
uh, here's another evangelist trying to sell us anything from the books. And that is absolutely needed. What do you think? Did you experience something similar? I definitely have. Um, it's like I said, right. They don't know either, but also their domain is very different and the kind of decisions they make are very different as well. Right. And so if we talk, if we say something like, okay, you know, there's, there's horrific, uh, there's a lack of, uh, psychological safety within the teams. That's a very clear problem to us. It's a very clear problem for the teams. What does that mean though? Like, how does that translate into their world? Right. And what we do then is then we say, well, if you don't understand the problem and you're the smartest person in the room, then, then clearly I need to push it more uh, or you're just being evil. Right. And I've certainly seen some coaches fall into that trap as well, where it's kind of this us versus them uh, thing. Yes, but, yes. but really, once again, it comes down to treating people with respect and treating people like humans. What are they struggling with? What does their world look like? Right. We know they're under a lot of pressure. Are they are they in a situation now where they are looked upon to manage something or make decisions on things that they don't understand that well themselves or problems that they're dealing with that they have no quick solution for? And so taking the time to understand that. Right. Now, that's not discounting the issues that you see at a team level. Right. But you're looking for the win win there. Right. I see a problem that you're having. I can link that to a, to a symptom that I'm seeing at the team level. Right. And that is our added value as coaches is that we see the system. Right. And we see where those things connect. Then we can say, hey, this thing that you're facing, that is a problem to you. That is a threat to you. Um, I think there's there's an option there that if we improve this thing, that that'll make your life a lot easier. And now you're not the person that comes to them with problems. You're not the person that comes to them with decisions, which to be honest is even worse, right? Yes. Remember yes. all their decisions are very dangerous. So if you're going to make their decision for them, that makes you very dangerous, right? Instead, you're saying, here's the system that I see. Here are the connections that I see. And here are some knobs and levers that I've identified for you that you uh, that you can either manipulate yourself or promote someone else manipulating like me or scrum masters or agile coaches or product owners or developers in your organization that will result in a better outcome right so treat them as humans right but 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 don't assume that they already have all this information and that they already know how the system works they don't they don't have the time Right. The amount of effort it takes to play a political game at high level um, means that there is very little time left to actually know what's going on in your organization. Right. And that's not them being yeah. derelict of duty. That is simply how the game is played. And if we want to improve that, then we need to find players that we like and empower them. Yes. And, uh, now I remember something related to having special knowledge. And basically, um, now I'm coaching about mentoring about eight, 10 BPs or SBPs. With more than half of them, we had the conversation of uh, scarcity mindset, insecurity, how to talk up, how to um, grow into the role, etc. Some of them, they've just been promoted. Some others, they've been VP for five years. Um, one particular case, one guy living in Hong Kong for, I don't know, three, four years. Hong Kong is really tough on COVID and they have strong lockdown measures. And um, him telling me, you know, my wife is here with me and I have two kids. We cannot go to street. And, and I was telling him like, does it, does it really pay off to be a BP? Because it doesn't seem like you're having a great life right now. And I'm saying that because you have this imposter syndrome you cannot show. You need to grow into your role or otherwise somebody else will. 
and you feel extremely trapped in certain situations and and we can talk about the golden cage etc and you your standard way of living got up to a level that you cannot let it go it's not an easy life so just when you see some bps being assholes or um, not paying attention just <laughs> indulge them a little bit just empathize with them a little bit because if you just scratch a little bit you're going to see they're not having a great time in yeah. in in many cases yeah and i think that kind of gets us to to our final point um and then we'll, yes, we'll that's right. go into we'll go into questions because i'm seeing some appear in the chat as well um and that is that is kind of the burden that comes with power um and the the burden that comes with power is that people start acting differently around you um sometimes uh, very conscious of it right they 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 want you to do something um either either for them or for their career um and so whenever they talk to you um right they're going to try to seem more positive right the the numbers may look a bit better or they're definitely going to make it or etc but you cannot take information you receive from people at face value and because some people are going to try to manipulate you for their own gain now that's 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 the minority the majority of people that you're going to deal with are just going to act different because of power right it's an involuntary yes. process right there's a certain amount of awe there's an expectation there's an there's a fear even in us right even in the outside coaches, right? We come in, we talk to an executive and we see the title and the big office and we see how hard it is to get a meeting or maybe even have to go through a secretary to get a meeting. Yes. And we come in with all of these assumptions that we are torpedoing on this poor person. And so, well, how are they going to trust us? We don't know them and yet we're treating them with all sorts of assumptions, right? So. Again, try to imagine this for a moment, right? You're under a magnifying glass. If you mess up and you're going to mess up because you know better than anyone that you've been very lucky in the past and you've made some calls that people said were brilliant that may have just been a coin flip, literally. I've, I've certainly had a few of those. So that's already the reality. Now you're getting information from downstairs, from the people that work for you, that are fuel for the decisions you have to make. And you know, right? Because no one wants to seem bad. No one wants to, uh, everyone wants to impress. Uh, no one wants to give you bad news that whatever numbers you see, whatever data you see, whatever reports you get to read, they've all been filtered in some way, right? Maybe not outright lies, but certainly they've been politically worded or, um, you know, they've they've maybe disembellished. Like, yes. yeah, we're having a little bit of trouble with the delivery pipeline. The delivery pipeline is down. That's ah, a little bit of trouble, right? So you can't trust anyone, right? You literally can't because of the effect you have on other people. Like even you being in a room is going to already alters the, the the quality of conversation, right? I've I've talked to CEOs, and this was actually one of the things that came up in the talk with Colleen um, at, at, at Lena Agile London, is that she just cannot attend certain meetings anymore because the right information doesn't surface if she's present merely because of her presence. And this is this is a woman who is an agile coach and probably one of the most empathic people I know. So the reality is you are alone. You are incredibly alone. The people that work for you treat you as a caricature of yourself. Sometimes voluntary, sometimes involuntary, sometimes for their own gain, sometimes merely because of the title you have and the power that you wield. Your peers are your competitors and your boss 
only demand success. You are alone. The concept of team I'm is thinking. utterly alien to you. You are alone. That is your world. And in that case, when you get a chance as a coach, this is uh, how to engage with executives. Therefore, I hope uh, those of you in the audience are either engaging or hopefully will be engaging with executives eventually or um, sooner than later, hopefully. So that's why when you engage with them, first thing, the most important thing you want to focus on is on building trust. You want this person to be a little bit less alone and to know that they can maybe not lean on your shoulder, but just have somebody that can tell you the truth or can tell you honestly what they see. And um, one story I wanted to share is um, about one year ago, I was asked in, in current organization, uh, can you go talk to this senior vice president? And said, sure. And they told him, you need to talk to an agile coach. So here we were in this meeting and he said, well, I'm here because I'm told that I need to talk to an agile coach. And I said, okay, I'm told that I need to talk to you. What are we going to do now? For real, two one hour meetings went by. We were talking personal stuff. His family uh, coming from India, then him growing up, having challenges, how he was feeling around with his team, how um, it was hard for him to uh, be himself when everybody was looking at him, admiring him, he's charismatic. And, and me listening, relating at, at my level, somehow sharing. After that time, that was the first moment that we talked about agility without using any of the agile jargon. So build trust is much more important than anything else. And the problem is the first time or first, second time that you do that, you want to be up to the challenge and you want to, and that's natural. You want to impress them with your knowledge, etc. cetera. Then you forget the most basic thing. And then um, another topic that I encourage you to look at is something called Grais Maxims, which is this idea of focus on sharing the right amount of information, make sure that this amount uh, information is truthful, make sure you don't use any jargon. It's so disappointing to see coaches go talk to an executive that did not attend. It doesn't matter if they did attend and start talking to them in terms of uh, sprints and burn down charts. And... No, I mean, just one thing I had to learn back in the day is translate absolutely every agile word for something that was non-agile that they could explain that anybody could understand. And obviously I see a lot of value in that, in, in the jargon, but not when you want others to understand you. There's this Feynman technique that you need to teach it to a child, then review and then course correct or, or adjust your language so that everybody is understanding you. I would adjust what a sprint is. I would adjust what story points are, what Scrum Master, Agile Coach. I would relate to that. I would explain it in such a plain way that everybody could understand. I never, ever, ever see anybody telling me, you don't know enough Agile because you don't use any Agile jargon. Never. And it comes, you, Will. Well, it comes it comes down to trust, right? And 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 jargon is is one of those very comfortable um cheats that we use to make ourselves seem smarter than we are. Right. And so yes. and so I've 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 certainly I've seen it happen. I've also done it myself earlier in my in my career that when I feel that that conversation isn't happening the way I want it to happen, right? I'm not seeing that trust form. I'm not seeing that openness is I, you try to overcompensate by making yourself seem way more valuable 
right? Be, be the kind of person that they need to be around because you have special knowledge that only you have access to. And so you, you start forming these absolute monstrosities of sentences with as many verbs as possible, right? And, um, whereas, whereas the point is, and I think that's, that, that, that really is kind of the challenge when talking to executives, what Jordi talked about is you need to establish that trusting foundation first, and that may not be work-related. And that's hard to do because probably by that point, you've looked around in the organization and you've seen some ongoing disasters or impending disasters where you're like, I need action on this right now, right? Before it turns into a real problem. And simply put, that's not the time. Like you, you, you cannot have that conversation at that point and trying to sell it or browbeat it into them isn't, isn't going to get you anywhere. So this is, this is one of the reasons why so many, so many top consultants have hobbies like squash and golf and the like, partially it's because, you know, they work so late that the only people that want to play with them are also in that industry. But the other reason is that's also where the executives are, right? That allows you to forge that that bond right and it's not going to be friendship right but enough similarities so that you become that outsider that doesn't that doesn't see the power but that sees the person right and once you see the person and they see you then it creates an opening where indeed following Grice's maximum, uh, maxims of, you know, be to the point and be concise and talk in a language they understand, is you can say, well, here's what I'm seeing in the organization. Yes. Right? Not here's what I need you to do, because that'll instantly destroy whatever you've built, but here's what I am seeing. Yes. And then, and then explore that together and sometimes those things don't work right and 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 this is this is you know the kind of kind of the elephant in the room is um you, you know you are going to meet um people that just don't care right there's two lines of business where you are way more likely to meet psychopaths that have zero empathy for people and that is top surgeons and executives. And that's because the way the game is played, it it promotes psychopathic behavior, right? It, it promotes making decisions uh, not to the benefit of people, but to the benefit of an Excel sheet. There's no way to know until those moments, right? You seem to have built a bond. You say, here, I, I'm, I'm seeing this issue. I'm seeing people being burnt out. I'm seeing a culture of fear. What do you want to do about it? And it might be that at that point, they say like, well, I know, I don't care. They're not coachable. Go away, right? Literally, it's it's not going to work. You cannot coach a psychopath. But, right, <laughs> those exceptions aside, usually what I found is there are empathic people. Um, and they may have seen some things. They may not have seen some things, but they might be stuck, right? Because whatever they do, it's going to be a big decision, right? And that's where you can help but you need that personal relationship. So yes. looking at the time though, because I think we have about an hour for this. I'm kind of looking at Aman and Jose here because Jose cut me off before as well. All right, we have a bit more time. So kind of looking at the timer, that's that's kind of the three things we wanna we wanted to get across, right? Is Is how to engage with executives is, I think the core of this is they're just people. They poop like everyone else. Um, yes. except for Kim Jong-un who doesn't, um, but yeah. you know, aside from going to that path. Yes. um, they are just people and for, for many in our, in our business, we fail to see that basic element, right? They are people in an incredibly tough situation under a lot of stress, under a lot of pressure, um, with a lot of expectations being heaped upon them and very alone because yes. they often are treated for their role and not for who they are and so if you want to engage with them don't fall into that same trap talk to the person get to know the person get to know their world show that empathy and respect 
and that'll get you places. Yes. And um, what, I, what I love about this talk is somehow we're describing the context and we're describing some, some tools. And uh, some tools have to do talk to the person, get strong contextual awareness, try to understand the political, uh, the political play that's going on and how you can help them thrive in that political game. Speak to them in a way that is non-aggressive, but um, whenever you have the trust, is honest, assertiveness, rights and maxims, etc. And focus on the problem instead of the solution. They don't care how many certifications you have. They don't care what Scrum, Kanban, save, um, flight levels, any of that. And it's a bit frustrating, right? Because you go and then you get certified by, by Jose and Actineo in flight levels and you think you're going to use that. And yes, you're going to use that, but not in the way you think you are. Nobody will go and ask, huh, by the way, tell me about how flight levels work. No, but you need to leverage that knowledge. And you can only do that when they trust you and when they feel comfortable having you around. Be brief in your answers. Ha, here's another one. Do not outsmart them. That's you want to really destroy tough. trust? That'll do it. You want to destroy trust? Outsmart them. If they say something dumb, and I've seen it, people failing miserably at this. Um, I, I, I typically have a saying that when I go and try to speak agile to somebody in an organization, they tell me, oh, agile is about this thing with the post-its. Um, if that's what they believe, for the next 30 minutes, for me, agile is that thing with the post-its. And then slowly, together, we will evolve their understanding if they say agile is mostly scrum and scrum doesn't work then agile is mostly scrum scrum doesn't work and how we grow from there because i still didn't build the trust and if since i didn't build the trust i'm not willing to challenge them if i challenge them right away okay um if it ends up in a confrontation you lost your opportunity so do not spot outsmart them Empathize with them when they acknowledge that you're empathizing and you're there willing to help slowly and you can figure out your way, get, uh, get them more educated without explicitly educating them in, in whatever topic, unless they ask you uh, directly. And be pragmatic and realistic. Um, realistic, don't, don't sell gibberish, don't sell weird stuff. Um, PowerPoints or whatever, just say something specific. If you can, just focus on the low hanging fruit. And that low hanging fruit will pave the way for you to focus on more um, systemic related problems. And be realistic. Don't talk about the future and when we're going to have five releases per day if they have two windows of opportunity per quarter. If they have two windows of opportunity per quarter that they, they need to roll out something to production, that's where you start. One of the things I like about Kanban is this idea of start where you are and then slowly go and increment. And and keep in mind, right? They are in positions of power. So even low hanging fruit for them uh, can be very high fruit for us. Uh, I remember at, at one client, um, uh, one of the conversations we had is he said, well, I'm not sure if if everyone in my team is is adequately prepared for these new ways of working. Uh, and uh, and he's like, well, what would you do in an ideal situation? I love that question. I said, well, I want to give everyone uh, just basic understandings of, of of professional scrum and professional Kanban. And he's like, Oh, well, what, what does that mean? He says, well, um, you know, we can do a lot with coaching, but I think just to make sure that everyone shares the same vocabulary, I would like four days of training for everyone. Um, you know, just so, just so we all have the same starting point and then we'll kind of coach and build up and build our practices from there. And I was like, that's a huge ask. They're never going to, they're never going to go. And he was like, oh yeah, sure. Cause the, the, the thing is, it's not that much money. It's not that much time. 
right? So for them, low hanging fruit for me, that got me into a situation where I could build a hugely competent team of people um, that then made life for them a whole lot easier because it became kind of their, their political weapon against the rest of the organization and saying, well, look how good my people are, which in turn paved the way for a lot more work in the transformation. Jordi, how about we, uh, we do some questions. Yeah. Uh, so I see one in the chat. Um, and this may be a very specific one. Um, it's how would we balance trying to be assertive about things like timelines and overpromising? Right. Usually someone in an executive position like the CEO wants you to give specific answers on timelines, and sometimes the answers aren't that straightforward. So how would how would we deal with that question? Um, okay, I can start. Uh, I think back in the day when Henry Niebuhr put together this video on product management, he was nailing it quite nicely. If you're focusing on um, addressing questions of, of time or the, the iron triangle. Basically, for me, it's as easy as did you did you did your homework? Did you build trust? If you did build trust, etc., then be honest about the conversation and say, look, honestly, I would love to give you a very specific answer. I I still don't have all the information. There's too much uncertainty. And then you you walk through the cone of uncertainty. If not, then you give them some time frame. Um, there's an important aspect here that is the fact that they want something by a certain date doesn't make it be ready by that date. And them knowing that it will not be ready is sometimes more relevant than pushing everybody and start cracking the whip onto people to get that ready. Sometimes it's like, it's not going to happen. Therefore, if you if you want to have your political game going on, you better start now. What about you, Will? Um, I think I think it goes it goes two ways, right? The the one is figuring out well, you know, is that is that hard timeline there because the organization wants it to be there, or is that hard timeline there because of some sort of outside pressure? Um, right. Uh, a few years ago, when uh, the uh, GDPR in Europe, the, the data regulation became a thing, um, there were a lot of companies that were very concerned about that timeline because it was very simple. Right. If you're not compliant by this date, we are going to fine you for a lot of money every day. Right. That timeline was non-negotiable. Right. So you, 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 you really couldn't say at that time, like, oh, yeah, it'll be done with when it's done. Right. So then the, of course, if it's just an internal deadline, it's just an internal deadline. It's usually negotiable. And, and honestly, if you look at the chaos reports from the last uh, two decades, you can see that most companies don't deliver on time at all. Uh, I think only in like 1% of the cases when it comes to big projects. So it's never been a problem. Um, but if they want timelines, right? Don't come in with your opinion. Don't come in saying that, well, you know, work is difficult and complex and it's hard to plan and yada, yada, because it's just going to sound like excuses, right? If the timeline is hard um, and, and then something you might want to consider looking into is something like flow metrics, right? Which is actually using data to make a forecast because then it's not your opinion then you are coming in with data that says, well, you know, looking at our looking at our history, right, and looking at the math, and the math is not that hard. Here's the projection looking forward. And in the model, right, and, and again, be very wary of using big words here and trying to be very, very big on the math, right? Again, make it really simple. Don't over jargon them is you know, using this prediction, we're seeing it's just not going to be done. Right. And that can be a tough conversation. Heck, I've been, I've been in conversations where I've looked at the strategic agenda for 2022 or 2023 of a company. And I said, well, actually looking at the measures, this agenda will be done somewhere in 2025. uh, If no new work emerges, which 
really they're not grateful at that moment. But it's not you saying that, right? It's the data saying that. And that can galvanize them into action. Right. And I know Jose has a similar example. I think for them it was like 2032 or <laughs> or something similar. Right. But again, find out why the deadline is there. Um, if it is a hard deadline, um, get your data. Uh, and make that conversation about the data and not about opinions. Um, and and be be helpful in that. Don't don't go to war. Don't go saying your timeline is wrong and you should feel terrible about opposing it on us. Right? That's not going to get you anywhere. It's I understand why it's there, and I want to help you. And I'm seeing a problem here, and I want to explore that problem with you. Yes, uh, related to that. Um, to, to this idea of not opposing them strongly. Um, I had a conversation with um, a coach that recently left or is leaving this week. And we had a very honest conversation. And the conversation was around uh, how can you influence the system? How can you irritate the organization in the way that things happen? And then um, obviously you start moving forward, etc. cetera. And, and my claim to him was, Look, we, and I hope he doesn't, I know he doesn't mind me bringing this up to, to, to the public, but um, my conversation one was you need to have not only one gear, you need to have two gears. One that has to do with um, irritating the system whenever needed and, and all of that. The other one that's more flexible, political, figuring out, uh, engaging that you want to use um, so that the system and people don't get tired of you always challenging, challenging, irritating, uh, and mentioning all of that. Because otherwise, and I'm relating that to one comment from uh, um, from Oystein, and he mentioned, I like this book from Humble Consulting. Um, otherwise, if you don't do that, then you you get too close personally to the team and then you cannot detach yourself and then you're kind of acting as a team protector that will not only not get you farther but would also um, put your the team uh, in, a, in a challenging situation when you leave. And one thing I dislike about uh, sometimes certain type of coaching situations is like I will stand my ground I will move forward da, 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 da. if they don't like me then I'm out and then later on they will see uh, that they were wrong good and you will not be there to help them so what's the good thing about being right when you lost the ability or, or the opportunity to influence the system that you spend so much time um, being next to and creating these, these boundaries. My suggestion is always see yourself, then see the system or see whoever you're dealing with. And there's a third entity that comes from Organizational Relations Relational Systemic Coaching, ORSC. There's yourself, the other person, and there's the third entity that's the relationship. So you work yourself and the relationship. You build on the relationship. And sometimes the other person will not like it or will be unhappy about that. But you focus on the relationship because otherwise, if you get too close to the person, their problems will your, become your problems. And you're not only empathizing, now you're sympathizing. And when you're sympathizing, you cannot think objectively. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Um, there's a next question from Don, Don McKellen. If you want to unmute and ask the question, you're more than welcome to. Otherwise, I'm sure we would be happy to read it out. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks. Uh, um, yeah, what, what would you do if you believe the problem you're being asked to focus on is either the wrong one, maybe you're even been pushed down the route of the wrong solution, um, or you think there's a much bigger and better prize that you could valuably help, valuably help with? Yeah, I have to say I was a little bit disappointed that that didn't come in with a very strong Scottish accent. Um, so, but we'll do our best regardless. Um, yeah, Dutch accent. 
<laughs> is al do the rest in a very Dutch accent. Yeah. Um, it's... You know, one thing, and and I think this is this is something that we we sometimes struggle with um, as coaches, whether that's internal coaches or external coaches. Um, it's not your company, and even if it is your company, it's not your accountability, um, right? And so we we advise and we explore. And we reveal issues, but ultimately, if the client says, this is the problem that I need to focus on, fully aware of the other things that you're mentioning, right? But they say, but this is the thing that that we focus on, then that'll be the thing they focus on, right? And, And you help them because you have to maintain that trust. Now... That doesn't mean letting go of the ball, right? That doesn't mean not not yes. focusing on the other problem, but maybe it's about solving this wrong problem first to create clout or to create the foundation for, for you to then introduce that more valuable problem. The other thing, of course, and, and this is this is kind of where humility comes in, which is which is tough for me because I'm really amazing. And so it's really hard to be humble sometimes, is they might know something you don't. They might see some value in this problem in their context that you can't see yourself. And if you're kind of going into that conversation saying, but this is the valuable thing that we should focus on that kind of exposes you to, to confirmation bias. Right. And, and that goes away from that conversation. So that would be kind of my, my first thing in, in, in saying, well, you know, if that's the problem they want to solve on and you've informed them, right. They, they do that fully cognizant of the context that you've sketched them and you've done your due diligence, then it's their accountability to make that selection, not yours. You cannot run the company for them nor should you. And that's hard because that's what we want to do though. Right. Cause we know better because that's, that's our burden that people look at us and say, you're the coach, you're the expert, you know, all of these things, you know, how to run yes. a modern company yes. in the 21st century. Right. And so yes. we start to believe that bullshit ourselves. We don't know how to run a company. We don't have a thousand direct reports. We don't have million dollar decisions laying on our heads. If I completely mess up my job, it doesn't matter to me. Like I still, I still get paid. I can go to my next client. Right? Yes. It's not my company. No, a- anyway, sorry, that was, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I cannot agree with you more. Um, it's, it's not your company, not your accountability. The way I express that, I, I'm, I'm trying to share with all of you the tricks that both Will and I are using. And uh, the way I express that is, look, now we, when we have built trust and then they they consult us, etc. It's like, look, I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm going to tell you why I think that way. And then you're going to make a decision. And I want you to know that no matter what decision you make, I will support you in that decision. That That Last sentence is the, the important one. I'm telling them, for example, I'm now working with somebody working on some tough integration and then redesigning the organization, etc. I'm telling him, I don't think it's a good idea to publicly announce this um, reorg. Um, I, I would wait a little bit because um, the dust hasn't settled yet and you might run into some, some challenges. And I want you to know if you make the decision, I will support you. And then whatever situations, challenges you will encounter, I will share with you how I think that that could be addressed. The next day after telling him that, he said, look, I have to announce it. I did not ask. I just told you, uh, listen to me. Uh, I told you so. I, I have to announce it. Okay, announce it. This is how I would announce it. And he announced it. The next day, we ran into problems. You don't use that to kind of 
finger pointing like, ah, like, okay, let's figure out how we can address that. So it's like, I cannot agree with you more well. We don't have the right to make decisions because we are not dealing with the consequences of those decisions. We have the right to share what we think with them because we build trust and to empower them to make whatever decision they believe is the right one and support them with our sometimes deeper and wider contextual awareness because we're used to that and we are only focusing on that when they're focusing on, on running multiple plates simultaneously. Now, what I do want to add to that is don't disregard yourself and your own principles in all of that, right? If you find yourself in a situation where you do your due diligence, right? You inform, you advise, you challenge, you've built that you've, you've built what you think is that trust. Um, and your, your client or your VP continuously ignores what you're saying, right? Making decisions, completely disregarding the information you bring them, um, going their own way, um, where you feel you're not adding value or you just feel frustrated all the time. Um, and I'm going to be very blasé about this. If you're stuck in that situation, leave. Right. And this, this is, this is the thing that a lot of, a lot of both, um, external coaches and consultants like ourselves, but also internal coaches and, and scrum masters and the like deal with is if you're in that situation and you don't feel like you're accomplishing anything, be somewhere else where you are valued because being stuck in a situation like that does really bad things to you mentally. And it's really frustrating. Right. So indeed, as Jose says, be prepared to fire a client. Right. And, and this is, this is, this is a make or break moment, right? There are, there are people that never, that can never do that. And either they they end up unhappy somewhere until eventually they're forced to leave. Right. So the decisions being yes. made for them and, and you always see the relief in their face or they give up, which is even worse, right? Cause you become part of an unmotivated yes. workforce and you start saying things yes. like that's just the way it is. Right, which is yes. honestly the those are the forbidden words for anyone in the change industry. That's just the way it is. Um, but the ones that are somewhat successful, and I'd like to count myself amongst them, but also but also Antonio Banderas playing Jordi uh, over here and and Jose and and a lot of others, they will have a story about a client they fired in the past. Right. Yes. Be true to yourself. Be true to yourself <laughs> with a with couple of caveats um, in, in my case. One of the caveats is if you are internal, it's different than if you are external and you're used to doing that. If you are internal, just wait for the opportunity to figure out to move to a different place and speed up your... Uh, a hiring process and go somewhere else. If you're external, I can understand that, but it's also so comforting to be in a client that pays you every month and, and is consistent. That my suggestion is life's too short to be in the wrong company, but um, you don't need to jump as well, at least in my case, as if let's burn the bridge and like, boom, yeah. okay. I know I'm not there. I know this is not going to change. I'm going to very actively and then give yourself one month, two months. Sometimes things change. And I had a not a very good time five, six months ago. I was not happy with how things were going. And then the moment you start thinking about moving on, you start caring a little bit less about being humble and nice and respectful and caring. And sometimes that unlocks certain things in the organization because you're brave enough to go talk to anybody and tell them what you think. So it's a combination. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah. Make sure you have multiple streams of revenue. Um, yes. Right. Don't, don't, helps. don't become dependent income. on anyone. Yes. <laughs> that certainly oh, helps. So, so true. So true. Well, uh, 10 minutes nice. ago. Yeah. 
Do we have any any other questions? I was also going to say, if you want to share a story, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Uh, no, I'm seeing a uh, seeing, uh, uh, question. What's the name of the cat? I have two cats. Uh, the one you saw was Lord Wobbles von Katzenstein. Um, the one you haven't seen yet is Detective Bob, the Ooze Mittens. Cool names. I don't have cats. I have a daughter. I don't know if I shall go her in. <laughs> Hairless cat. All right. Here's a, yeah, I have to say, fascinating session. You know, I'm surprised the time's gone by so quick. So many useful yeah. points, so many useful areas of discussion. I'll say invaluable to the audience as well. Um, I'm going to share the YouTube link again for where the video is going to be posted in probably a couple of days. Um, thank you. Thank you both for a fantastic session. Thanks for the audience as well. Um, yeah, I think we're I think we're pretty much done here for today. Um, our next session will be up soon. You two probably have you back next year for sure. I reckon we're going to have a part two to this conversation and, and see what you've learned across the year or so. See so you want to add anything to this discussion. But yeah, awesome. Okay, thanks everyone. I will stop thank the recording. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Actineo, for giving us the opportunity 